Every year, more than 1.5 billion tires are discarded, and an increasing portion of them is now being directly converted into fuel oil. This means rubber waste is gradually replacing part of the petroleum extracted from deep underground, easing the pressure on fossil resources and on the traditional oil industry itself. In this video, we follow the journey of turning waste into energy. Old tires are fed into a pyrolysis process where extreme heat in an oxygen-free environment breaks the rubber down into fuel oil, combustible gas, and carbon black. What was once an environmental burden can now become an alternative energy source, partially replacing traditional fossil fuels. If you want to witness how a discarded tire can be distilled into oil, stay with the factoring, because this journey will completely change the way you see waste and the value of hidden resources. For decades, oil has been regarded as the lifeblood of the modern world. It supplies nearly 30% of global energy and powers more than 90% of all transportation systems, from cars and aircraft to cargo ships. Even a small fluctuation in oil prices can trigger inflation, drive up living costs, and cause widespread economic instability. In the United States, oil is not just an economic resource, but a powerful political tool closely tied to decisions on sanctions, energy security, and control of global markets. The oil and gas industry can offer salaries exceeding 100,000 USD per year, yet this comes with extremely harsh working conditions and high levels of risk. Because of this deep dependence, the world is being pushed to search for alternative sources of oil, and this is where waste tire recycling is beginning to stand out as a realistic and more sustainable path forward. Collecting used tires is not a secondary step. It is the foundation that determines the efficiency of the entire recycling process. Tires are recovered from auto repair shops, tire service centers, transport fleets, scrap yards, industrial landfills, and government-run collection programs. In many countries, every tire sold includes a recycling fee, ensuring that when it reaches the end of its life, it is returned to a controlled processing system instead of being discarded freely into the environment. Tires are also one of the most difficult types of waste to manage. They are bulky, non-biodegradable, and extremely flammable. A tire dump fire can burn for weeks, releasing toxic smoke that contains dioxins and heavy metals. This is why collection is not only a logistical task, but a critical measure to reduce environmental damage and protect public safety. At the collection site, tires go through a quick inspection, basic cleaning, and sorting by size and type to optimize the pyrolysis process. They are then transported to the recycling plant. From this moment on, the tires are no longer waste. They become raw energy resources, carrying the potential to be transformed into fuel oil for industrial and energy use. Before tires can become feedstock for oil production, the reinforced steel inside them must be removed. Every tire contains a steel framework made of thin but extremely strong wires that help it maintain its shape and withstand heavy loads and high internal pressure during use. On average, steel makes up about 10 to 15% of a tire's total weight. This means that with millions of tires recycled each year, the amount of steel recovered can reach hundreds of thousands of tons. If this metal is not removed early, the pyrolysis process becomes less stable, consumes more energy, and produces lower oil yields. The tires are first cut into large pieces using industrial shredders, then transported along conveyor systems equipped with powerful permanent magnets or high-capacity electromagnets. These magnets attract and remove nearly all steel fibers from the rubber, while the material continues to move through the line. In modern processing plants, steel separation efficiency can exceed 95%, leaving the remaining rubber much cleaner and more uniform for further treatment. The recovered steel is not considered waste. It is compressed into bales, lightly cleaned, and sold to steel mills as a valuable source of recycled metal. Meanwhile, the rubber, now free of steel, becomes an almost pure hydrocarbon feedstock ready for fine grinding and pyrolysis, where it will be converted into fuel oil. Before mechanical processing begins, the tires pass through a high-pressure washing system that removes mud, oil residue, and embedded gravel from the surface, protecting cutting blades and crushing shafts from premature wear. 
This may seem like a minor step, but it plays a decisive role in maintaining the stability and service life of the entire downstream production line. In the primary shredding stage, whole tires are fed into high-torque cutting machines, where slowly rotating alloy steel blades slice them into coarse fragments measuring several inches across. This low-speed cutting method minimizes heat generation, preventing the rubber from softening or sticking to the blades, while shaping the material into a form suitable for further processing. The shredded pieces then move into secondary grinding, where their size is reduced even further and the internal steel reinforcement is mechanically fractured and gradually separated from the rubber. High-strength magnetic systems recover the steel directly from the material flow, turning this reinforcement into a valuable stream of recyclable metal. The final product of this stage is crumb rubber, finely shredded rubber with a tightly controlled particle size. At this point, the tire has completely lost its original form and has become a hydrocarbon-based feedstock, ready for classification and feeding into the pyrolysis reactor for oil production. At the end of the line, all material passes through a screening system. Particles that meet the required size specifications continue forward, while oversized pieces are sent back to the grinder for further processing. Among all the size fractions produced, the properly graded particles are the most critical because they form the ideal feedstock for pyrolysis distillation, where rubber is converted into fuel oil, combustible gas, and carbon black. After grinding and screening, the crumb rubber still contains moisture and fine dust. If it were fed directly into the pyrolysis reactor, this water content would consume a large amount of thermal energy, destabilize the system, and reduce oil yield. For that reason, the rubber particles must be completely dried before they can become an effective energy feedstock. The material is sent into a rotary drying drum where hot air at temperatures ranging from 200 to 260 degrees Fahrenheit flows continuously through the chamber to drive out moisture. As the particles tumble and mix inside the rotating drum, their surfaces become dry, clean, and far more uniform. This process is tightly controlled by temperature sensors and automated hot air regulation systems. The goal is to remove moisture efficiently without overheating the rubber, which could cause partial burning or damage the polymer structure. Maintaining this balance is critical because it directly affects both the stability of the pyrolysis process and the quality and yield of the fuel oil that will be produced. Once the crumb rubber has been completely dried, it is fed directly into the pyrolysis reactor. This is a heavy, thick-walled steel vessel, usually built in the form of a long cylindrical tube. It is fully sealed and insulated with multiple thermal layers up to keep the internal temperature stable. Depending on the design, the reactor may remain stationary or rotate slowly, but the core objective is always the same, to create an oxygen-free environment where the material is not burned, but instead broken down by heat alone. The entire system is fully automated, controlling feed rate, temperature, pressure, and gas flow to keep the process stable and continuous. As the rubber particles move deeper into the reactor, the temperature gradually rises to around 800 to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. At this level of heat, the long polymer chains that form the structure of rubber can no longer remain intact. They begin to crack into smaller hydrocarbon molecules and escape as dense, hot vapor. The rubber does not ignite and no flame is created. Instead, it undergoes a chemical melting, similar to a distillation process carried out in a sealed environment. The newly formed vapor is immediately drawn out of the reactor and sent into a rapid cooling system. Here, the heavier hydrocarbon compounds condense first, changing from gas into liquid and forming pyrolysis oil. This stream is the main product and the most valuable output of the entire process. Only after the oil fraction has been extracted almost completely does the remaining vapor continue further through the system. These lighter molecules do not easily condense under normal conditions and become pyrolysis gas. Rather than being wasted, this gas is routed back to fuel the reactor itself, helping maintain operating temperature and significantly reducing the need for external energy input. Meanwhile, the solid material left behind inside the reactor gradually transforms into carbon black, 
a carbon-rich solid that preserves the final portion of the tire's original energy. On average, every 1,000 kilograms of dried crumb rubber fed into a pyrolysis reactor produces about 400 to 450 kilograms of fuel oil, around 80 to 120 kilograms of gas that can be used to power the system itself, and roughly 300 to 30 kilograms of carbon black, which remains as a solid fuel or an industrial raw material. This means that from waste rubber alone, most of the tire's original energy is preserved in the form of oil and gas. Instead of becoming a disposal problem, discarded tires are transformed into a genuinely valuable energy source, turning industrial waste into usable fuel rather than something that simply needs to be managed or buried. From this point forward, the tire no longer exists in any physical form. It has been fully separated into three streams, oil that is collected first, gas that is reused as fuel, and carbon black that remains inside the reactor. This is how a factory quite literally distills energy from waste. And while one part of an old tire is transformed into oil key to generate energy, the rest begins a different journey, one that leads back to our streets, blending into every meter of asphalt we travel across each day. When crude oil has been distilled to obtain the heavy fraction and stone aggregate has been crushed and screened, both converge at the asphalt mixing plant, the place that defines the final quality of asphalt. From storage bins, aggregate is discharged onto steel conveyors and carried into a rotary dryer stretching dozens of meters long. Direct flames heat the material to over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, about 150 degrees Celsius. Inside, the aggregate tumbles continuously within the rotating drum, while high-powered fans draw out every trace of moisture, ensuring each stone is completely dry before blending. Exiting the dryer, the hot aggregate is lifted into a multi-deck vibrating screen tower. Powerful vibrations classify the material by size. Large stones form the framework, medium grains fill the gaps, and fine particles bind the entire structure together. Electronic weighing systems immediately measure each fraction, combining them according to a preset mixing formula. At the same time, the heavy oil fraction drawn from the bottom of the distillation tower kept fluid by preheating to 300 to 320 degrees Fahrenheit is pumped steadily through pipelines, ready to merge with the aggregate. All of this flows into the forced mixer, a sealed steel chamber with two massive counter-rotating shafts, their motion blends the materials thoroughly, coating every grain of aggregate with hot binder and filling every gap. A mixing cycle lasts about 30 to 45 seconds, with temperature carefully maintained so the blend is neither too stiff nor too runny. The entire process is closely monitored by a central computer system, from material ratios to mixing time, ensuring every batch achieves uniform quality. When the mixing cycle ends, the hot asphalt mix is discharged into a heated surge hopper located just beneath the mixer. This is a crucial intermediate step. The hopper keeps the temperature steady at about 275 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly 135 to 150 degrees Celsius, and prevents the asphalt from sticking together. From the hopper, the mix is gradually released into the hot storage bin, where mechanical paddles constantly stir the material so it does not segregate or clump. Only then does the specialized dump truck move into position beneath the discharge gate. The entire bed and sidewalls of the truck have been coated with an anti-stick layer, ready to receive the hot load of asphalt. Once the truck is filled, the mix is immediately covered with an insulated tarp to retain heat, preparing it for the short but critical journey to the paving site. As soon as the dump truck leaves the plant, the hot asphalt mix must be kept at the proper temperature throughout the journey. At the construction site, the truck reverses directly into the asphalt paver and unloads the mix into its receiving hopper. From there, conveyors and augers distribute the material to the rear, laying it down as a continuous layer across the prepared roadbed. At the back, the screed, controlled by hydraulics and guided by laser sensors, ensures the mat is laid with the exact thickness, smoothness, and slope required by design. While the asphalt is still hot, a fleet of heavy rollers immediately takes position. 
First comes the smooth steel drum roller, giving the mat its initial compaction. Next, the rubber tire roller, weighing tens of tons, presses the aggregate tightly together, sealing the voids. Finally, the vibrating steel roller finishes the surface, increasing density while leaving it smooth and even. Throughout the entire process, the temperature of the mix is closely monitored because once it cools below 200 degrees Fahrenheit, about 95 degrees Celsius, the asphalt hardens and loses its ability to bond. From a discarded tire, the journey does not end in a landfill. It is separated into oil to generate energy, gas to sustain the system itself, and solid material that returns to the world in the form of stronger roads and infrastructure. Waste is no longer the final destination. It becomes part of a resource cycle where every component of the tire finds a new purpose in modern life. If you find this journey thought-provoking, stay with the Factorin. Follow the channel to discover more stories hidden behind things we often consider worthless. And share this video so more people can see the true power of recycling.